Welcome to the Wealth is in the Details podcast. In this podcast, financial planner Peter Raskin helps families and business owners understand and prepare for their wealth journey. Along the way, thoughtful and detailed planning can provide clarity and confidence as clients confront a multitude of financial decisions. Listen in as Peter shares stories and insight into people's wealth journeys. Now, let's get into today's podcast. Hello and welcome to Wealth is in the Details with Peter Raskin from Raskin Planning Group. Before we get started, audience, happy birthday, Peter. How are you? Thanks, thanks, Eric. It was uh, it was last week, so I'm yeah, uh, I'm over it. that celebration. <laughs> well, I'm not, so we're saying happy <laughs> birthday right now. Uh, but what we are also talking about is you have been traveling, so you got to do some traveling for your birthday, right? Yeah. Well, it was the timing worked out perfectly, and I'll tell you, it was so so much fun to get out and something we hadn't really done uh, for a couple of years. So it was great to. To get out there, I was uh, skiing in um, in Utah for a week, and then because uh, uh, California is only a, a couple hours away um, by plane, we flew to uh, Southern California and spent oh, some man. time uh, in the sun and walking on the beach and walking in the hills. And seriously, yeah, so it was you went really nice. And then walked on the beach. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was it was pretty darn nice, and and got to spend real. Real quality time with my wife, and which was oh, that's awesome. that was the best part, and and then I I got to work, you know, I worked a little bit here and there, so okay, move things forward, so it was yeah, great, absolutely. Well, that that is fun. Congratulations, and I'm so glad you're back, um, because again, we get to do this podcast, and we're talking about something today. I don't think you've ever spoken about on the on the podcast, at least not in my memory. And your your topic is direct indexing, and and you've spoken about you know, what an index is. And I know what an index is, but what is direct indexing? Yeah, this will, this might be a, a little wonky for some of our, our listeners, but, okay. it, but I, I think it's a really important topic. Uh, it, direct indexing, it's been around for over a decade now, and, and it's currently um, in the financial advisor, advisory world, it's a real hot topic. And, but I don't see it being discussed in the popular press. And I think that's going to change real soon. I think that's it, it, it's out there, but I, I, that's why I wanted to talk about it. And I, I, I think it'll be interesting to to many of our listeners. Yeah, and, and I know that to help you talk about it, you've got a guest on the podcast today, and I'm assuming that he is he's some sort of expert on this. Uh, that you guys are going to just really dive into this deeply. Yeah, I'm, I'm real excited. Um, Matt Potter uh, is a CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. He's a Director of Investment Services at SEI Private Trust Company. Uh, SEI is a, a global investment firm that, that provides technology and custodial services to, to the financial service industry, as well as investment management services to individuals and families and institutions. And, and, and frankly, they're, they're one of our real important partners and many of our clients utilize their their resources and expertise. And while SEI is, isn't affiliated with the Raskin Planning Group or or with Lincoln Financial Advisors, my my broker dealer, I've been working with them for for over twenty six years. And and I'm real happy that that I'm able to welcome Matt over over these many years. Matt's become a, a friend, and I'm I'm just so glad to know him. And and he's been so such a great resource. And I'm, I'm happy he's joining us today. So, so Matt, um, could you tell our listeners about your journey to SEI and what you're doing now? And, and I'm particularly interested if you could share uh, how you went from a master's in psychology to investment management. Sure, absolutely. And uh, thanks for having me on. I'm very, uh, very happy to be able to do this. And yes, my uh, career journey has been an interesting one. I've been in the financial services industry for over 25 years. But as you mentioned, I went to grad school for psychology. I was originally uh, going to get my PhD, become a university professor, live a long, happy life in academia. And I quickly realized academia and I were not a good fit. So I um, made an alternative plan and moved into the field of market research, which is sort of like psychology applied in a business setting. I wasn't really crazy about the firm, but 
they started a 401k plan when I was there. I knew nothing about investing. So I started researching, I started reading, and just the more I read, the more fascinated I became. And pretty soon I was spending more time managing my own portfolio than <laughs> doing my actual job. So I thought I really need to turn this into a career. So I got an opportunity and uh, again, have, have been uh, around for doing this for a while. I, I spent a fair amount of time working with a lot of uh, portfolio managers, uh, equity stock portfolio managers. And one of the teams, actually, we uh, created our own small boutique and we wanted to get onto SEI's manager platform. And we went through the process, the due diligence process. Uh, we were unsuccessful, but I was able to join SEI five months later uh, and really come in with kind of a unique perspective, having been through SEI's due diligence process from the manager's perspective. Uh, and I've been with SEI almost nine years. And, you know, if all goes well, plan to stay here until retirement. <laughs> well, I hope you do. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being, again, thank for being a, such a great resource for us. Absolutely. Uh, and, and before we go into get, get into the direct investing, uh, I think we need to give our listeners a, a basic background about investing. It, it, for, so for some listeners, this will be, this will be, not this won't be new news, but but for many, I think it will be helpful. And I think it's vital we talk about tax efficiency when it comes to investing. Uh, I talked about this on previous podcasts, uh, but I think some of our listeners again need that primer. Can you discuss how an investor could actually benefit when they sell a stock for a loss? Sure, and I think some of it goes back to the concept of uh, when you buy a stock and then you sell it you're taxed on the profit that you make. So the difference between uh, what you sell it for and what you bought it for, uh, that's the capital gain or level of appreciation. Now, one of the things the IRS allows you to do is to, when you have capital gains in your portfolio, you can offset them uh, with losses. You know, most people intuitively kind of don't want to uh, realize a loss, but Again, they can make a portfolio more tax efficient uh, because if you sell a security for less than you bought it, and you could certainly purchase uh, another similar security uh, to fill that slot, now you can use that loss to offset your gain and that can help reduce your taxes. So um, sometimes it can be very advantageous to, to take a loss from an after tax perspective. Yeah, it's a really important concept. Uh, this whole idea of of a harvesting uh, gains and losses, it, it can it can it can make a difference in an overall uh, portfolio return. Uh, so, so Matt, let's continue with this investing one hundred and one. Uh, this course we're we're, we're briefly <laughs> br briefly giving. Investors can also buy in, they can buy individual stocks and bonds, or they can buy funds or pooled investment accounts. Could you briefly describe the, the differences and, and, and talk about advantages and disadvantages? Sure. Um, so if you talk about uh, pooled vehicles, most people think of mutual funds uh, or exchange-traded funds or ETFs, um, and these will tend to own a, a large basket of securities. Uh, they can be very diversified, and they tend to have lower investment minimums. So you can uh, invest with a smaller amount, you know, maybe a thousand, twenty-five hundred dollars, what have you, and get uh, a get a, a part ownership of a very large basket of individual securities. Uh, so you can you can be very diversified, own a lot with not that much of an investment. Um, you also can access parts of the market that maybe are a little bit more challenging to invest in directly. You know, for example, foreign stocks. You don't have to open up uh, an account uh, in a foreign country or worry about currency translation or things like that, or high yield bonds or things that are more difficult to trade directly. Uh, you can just you know, have the mutual fund company or the ETF complex uh, do it for you. And then another advantage with them is you know, the investor statement. Uh, you you will get a smaller statement when you have a mutual fund. Uh, if you actually own the individual securities, uh, each one of them is going to be uh, listed on the statement. So you know, if you have uh, an investment that includes you know dozens or maybe even hundreds or potentially even thousands of individual securities, they're all going to be listed. You know, you're going to get a pretty large uh, large statement. For some clients, that uh, that turns out to be a disadvantage. If you own the individual stocks, though, 
you have a lot more flexibility and in a lot of different ways. And I think we'll hit on some of these issues, but you, you can choose to buy or sell uh, certain stocks or to not hold other stocks for a variety of reasons. You also have more control over taxes. So you can control when you buy something, when you sell something. Uh, this can be really important because even the length of time that you own a security before you sell it can make a difference in terms of how you're taxed on it. You know, if you own a security for one year or less and you sell it for a gain, that's going to be a short-term capital gain. And that's usually taxed at a higher rate than a long-term capital gain if you own it for more than a year. So uh, having that control can be uh, important. And also there's more transparency. You know exactly what you own. You don't have to uh, sort of look for the disclosures within a mutual fund. You can just all see it right there in your account and know real time uh, exactly what, co what companies that you own. So certainly there are uh, advantages and, and disadvantages with, uh, with each of them. So, so um, along the lines of, of buying individual stocks or, 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 or funds, either a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, investors can actually hire professionals to actively manage basket of, of stocks and bonds or that mutual fund. So there's active professional management, but investors can also buy an index. Or, or can buy a fund that looks a lot like an index. Could you, again, describe the differences and the advantages and disadvantages of, of either being actively managed or, or buying an index? Sure. And buying indexes, commonly known as uh, passive investing, is something that has really, I think, prolifer proliferated over time. Uh, and there are a lot of different indices. So there are a lot of different styles, segments of the market that, uh, that investors can get access to. I think one of the big benefits that investors see is they are typically lower cost. Active management uh, usually costs more than uh, passive management because the passive manager is simply replicating an, an index, uh, either owning all the names or a subset of the names. Index investing, passive uh, investing also tends to have lower turnover. They don't trade as often, and, and that also tends to generate less capital gains that the fund then has to distribute. Um, the returns also so while you're not going to outperform an index with a passive uh, approach, you're also not going to underperform it by very much. Really, the only difference should be fees, whereas the average active manager, you know, there's no guarantee that they're going to outperform. Uh, and in fact, the average active manager in certain asset classes may actually underperform because of the, of the fees that they charge. As one kind of disadvantage that uh, indexes have is you, you're the index provider really is sort of at the mercy of the index itself. They have to own all of the stocks um, if they're going to be a true index fund that are within the index. Even if a company is has really bad news coming out, uh, you know, maybe headed towards bankruptcy, is in an undesirable place. I mean, great example. More recently, uh, a number of indices uh, used to have exposure to Russia. Many of them have since dropped that exposure, but a lot of index funds uh, were stuck with with some of these stocks and really you know weren't able to to sell them before they were dropped from the index. Um, on the active side. They do cost, generally cost more, but you're getting expertise. You're getting a fund manager uh, who is really overseeing the portfolio, making decisions about which stocks to buy and sell. Again, I've worked with a number of these teams, uh, so a little bit of my bias may shine through, but I've seen how much work they do. You know, they talk to managements, they really study all the financial statements. Uh, they really are looking to know these companies as well as possible and constantly um, oversee them. Uh, there is the possibility of output performing. Uh, again, it, nothing is guaranteed, but there are some asset classes that aren't as well followed by investors, by analysts, uh, you know, smaller companies, for example, uh, where we say these areas are less efficient. So there may be more opportunities for an active manager to outperform. And they also can adjust their portfolio. So if economic conditions change, if market conditions change, uh, again, if, if, um, you know, if, if you're going into a, a period where you think airlines are going to be negatively impacted, Impacted, or technology is going to be negatively impacted, or what have you, uh, you can move away from those uh, sectors or industries and emphasize other parts of the market. Yeah, I, I think um, this is it. Will be an ongoing discussion for 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 a long, long time 
uh, I think whether active management or 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 passive investing is the way to go. I, I'm my my belief is that there's no right or wrong here. That um, some clients prefer to pay less. Passive might be uh, more in line with what they with what they want. Other managers, other other investors are are more willing to um, hire professional management and are are don't, don't mind the extra fees uh, because they see value in that. My my feeling is let's do both. <laughs> let's mm-hmm. let let's let's focus on uh, uh, indexing or passive management where where it can be where it can be helpful, and let's focus on active management where when it can be helpful. So. Yeah. I, I, there's no right or wrong here, but let's now kind of steer this conversation back toward index investing um, or directing indexing. I'm sorry. So, so, so we've talked about passive versus active. We talked about buying individual stocks um, or, or using funds. And he, here's where it gets uh, interesting. Investors can now hire a manager, manager that can directly purchase for a client, a basket of stocks that will act a lot like an index. So they're directly buying the stocks. How does how does that work, and what are the advantages of doing that? Sure, and yeah, this this goes to the question that Eric posed at the front: What is direct indexing? Really, you're essentially looking to track or replicate the performance of an index, but without owning all of the stocks within that index. You're going to own a a subset or a sample uh, of those individual stocks. So, for example, uh, you may be trying to replicate, say, the Russell 1000 index. You don't have to own all 1000 plus securities. You could do it with maybe 125 or 150 individual stocks. And now the way that's done is you want the smaller subset to have many of the same characteristics as the index. So similar uh, industry weights, uh, similar you know, weights of you know, very large versus sort of mid-sized companies. Uh, and this is usually done through quantitative uh, means through process called optimization, where you look back and say, you know, maybe there are, let's say, you know, five or six different oil companies within the index. Well, maybe you just need to own one. You know, if they all tend to behave much the same way, you're not going to really lose that much by owning just that one instead of all of them. Uh, so that's really the process that's done. And it's you know, constantly refined to, to look at you know, what potential risks could there be by owning fewer names than are within the index. Um, and that's what we call tracking error. How closely does the performance of this subset track to the actual index itself? And now, in terms of the advantages of doing this, you know, we tend to see a number of different things that, that clients really uh, like from this approach. Uh, first of all, I mentioned before transparency. They, they know exactly what they have. Uh, they can always see what the stocks are within their portfolio at any point. Um, there's cost. Again, this, these types of strategies, while they're not purely passive. Again, they are looking to replicate the performance of an index. So they are closer to uh, passive than to active. And therefore, the costs tend to be, tend to be lower. And that certainly can be, uh, can be a favorable point. There also is more of an element of control. Uh, again, securities can be purchased or sold at whatever timing makes sense. Um, you can Put a number of different uh, restrictions on portfolios. You know, maybe there are certain types of companies you don't want to own, or maybe you worked for a company for a long time. You own a lot of the company stock already. You don't need to buy more in the index. That you could do. Um, and from a tax efficiency perspective, this is where you can really see some some benefits. Um, an index, because you know, I went back to the example of of, um, of the oil companies. Let's say you own a portfolio and they've got uh, an oil stock. And um, this obviously was, is not currently where oil prices are, are so high, but let's say oil prices suddenly drop and the stock that you own drops quite a bit. Well, now you can sell that company at a loss and you can buy another oil company that's going to behave in much the same way to replace it. So you still have exposure there. But now, again, you've harvested that loss and you can use that loss uh, to offset gains uh, in other places within your portfolio. Um, And I would also say as a related note, there tend to be fewer surprises here than if you have uh, an actively managed mutual fund. 
Um, mutual funds are required to distribute their capital gains. Uh, they typically do this year end in December, but some may, may do it mid year as well. Uh, and whether you've owned that fund for 10 or 20 years, or if you just bought it, um, you're still going to have that capital gains distribution and it's going to be a taxable event for you. Uh, so, and you don't know really exactly what that distribution is going to look like um, in, until you kind of get to get to the point where it actually happens. Um, that can be a negative surprise. Um, and even when you, even if you had say several different uh, managers managing portfolios of individual stocks, that can still raise issues because you know the managers may not necessarily know how long you've owned a stock. You know, again, you may have owned a stock for 364 days. Suddenly, they decide to sell it from their portfolio, and now you've got a short-term gain. Maybe they didn't mean for that to happen, but if they're overseeing uh, thousands of accounts, they may not be taking your particular tax situation into account. And on top of that. You may have a situation where, let's say one manager harvests a loss, uh, as we talked about, another manager could actually buy that stock back without knowing sort of what the first manager was doing. There's a thing called the wash sale, where if you sell a security for a loss, and then within 30 days, you buy that security back, well, now you've lost the benefits of that loss. So even if manager A harvests a loss, which can be advantageous, Manager B might uh, unwittingly uh, undo the impact of that loss by purchasing the same security. And so if you have uh, a direct indexing solution, um, you will typically avoid those kinds of negative surprises. Yeah, I, th I think what's, what to me is so interesting is if you, if you, if you compare it to uh, investing in, in an index fund, whether it's an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund, you know they're they're buying the majority of that index. So as you your example was the Russell 1000, which owns a thousand large company stocks in the United States. Well, in any given period of time, not all 1000 stocks are going to be down or up in value. Right. <laughs> and if the majority um, of your stocks are are up because the market's done very well, it's kind of like um you know a, a uh, the the uh, the tide rises all boats, you know, if, if, if that happens. But there's always going to be some stocks within that index that are having having a tough time for whatever reason. And so the manager can sell those stocks that are experiencing a loss. They're harvesting the loss, which can be used to offset maybe up to, up to three thousand dollars of of earned income, but can also be used to offset gains in that year or in future years. That's that's tremendous over time. Exactly. And they also don't have to do it at year end. I mean, some people do a loss harvesting exercise in November or December. Uh, there's nothing like a deadline to, to spur people to action. But a manager who has the authority to, to loss harvest, they could do it whenever the market drops. It could be in March, it could be in August. They don't necessarily have to wait until year, year end to do it. So they can be more opportunistic with that approach. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that um, year to date. Um, this has been a tough, a tough market for for again a variety of reasons, and um, the managers are actively harvesting losses, which sounds like a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but given the fact that we have this uh, difficult market, it's a good thing. Exactly. So the other, one other aspect of, of this control that I'd like to talk a little bit was how a, an investor could, could possibly use some of the highly appreciated stock that they have and, and, and transfer that to um, a charity and why that would be advantageous. Sure, exactly. And you, you can certainly, the great thing about charitable contributions is you don't just have to donate cash, you could donate appreciated securities. So if you bought something and now it's trading much higher, you don't have to realize that gain yourself. You could donate uh, the security and have the charity sell it and they're a tax exempt entity, so they don't have to worry about that. But if you had a mutual fund, say, or an ETF, you'd have to contribute shares, you'd have to donate shares of that 
pooled vehicle. But if you have a direct indexing approach, let's say one of your securities just really did well, shot the lights out, and now represents a bigger part of the portfolio, well, you could donate just that security or some of the shares of that security to kind of bring your account back into balance. So again, you do have more control over uh, what you could buy or sell and also what you could uh, donate to charity if, if that's something you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I see, you know, th- these, these advantages of, of, of direct indexing, direct indexing can really be powerful over time. We don't know how to quantify that annually because every year it's a little bit different. Some years we're experiencing more losses and therefore we can realize more losses to, to, to capture other years, we're, we're not seeing as much loss in, in our stock portfolio. But on average, over, over many, many years, um, this approach is very tax efficient and really provides excess returns. I think about it as, I think about it as uh, tax alpha. <laughs> you know, it's, it's additional returns that you're getting because of the, of the, uh, the management uh, of the portfolio. Right, you can keep more of what you make, essentially. Yep. What are some of the the newer developments that you're seeing in in this direct indexing space? So there have been a few different things happening. One of them, I think, has just been the expansion of um, ESG investing, sustainable investing, values-based investing, whatever term you want to use, but essentially being able to align your investments with your own values or certain social or environmental considerations. So you could create a portfolio that's going to look a lot like the Russell 1000 or whatever index you want, but you could exclude, say, companies associated with, I don't know, adult entertainment or gambling or or what have you. Uh, you could also emphasize uh, certain you know positive attributes within companies and maybe give them more weight. Um, there, you know, you can do this with international companies too. You you could own uh, a direct index of um, an international index, and you can you can do it using. Uh, U.S. securities, uh, American depository receipts, so you don't have to open up, you know, accounts in other countries or anything along those lines. Uh, and there are ways that you can tilt towards what we call factors. You could call it styles. Um, think of this as, you know, there there are different approaches to. Uh, investing. So, if you wanted to emphasize, say, momentum, you know, you you like to have stocks that um, have you know growing or accelerating earnings or growing or accelerating stock price. You could tilt more towards those stocks, um, or maybe your portfolio has a number of securities like that, and you want to balance it out. We well, could tilt more towards value, owning uh, lower priced securities and looking for mean reversion, or you could own quality, emphasizing uh, companies that you know have stronger balance sheets or, or whatever the, the factors are. So that's another way that you don't necessarily have to replicate the index completely. You could start uh, with the index and then tilt in a direction uh, depending on how you want your portfolio to look. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. As I mentioned, I'm an advocate of direct in- indexing. I think it makes sense. As I also said, I think active management has its place as well. Could, could you Talk a little bit about how direct indexing and a, and can, and an active tax quarterback can complement the active manager. Sure, absolutely, and and yeah, you're right. This this can be a very interesting approach because you could use direct indexing to get a lot of your exposure in some of the asset classes that, again, where an active manager may not have as much of an advantage. Uh, often people think of U.S. large companies, uh, you know, such as, you know, say the S&P 500 or Russell 1000 or, or a similar index. You could use direct indexing to kind of get your exposure there. And then you could bring in some active managers in areas that are less efficient, uh, where maybe smaller companies or um, international companies or, or some other place where an active manager might have a little more of an advantage. And what's interesting here is that there may be some overlap. I mean, the index may own shares of a certain company and the active manager may also own some of the shares of of that company. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because if the active manager decides to sell the shares of that company, well, now 
the the uh, the tax overlay, the tax quarterback who's overseeing, and, and and I, it's usually a quantitative algorithm. It's not necessarily a bunch of people with green eye shades looking over spreadsheets all day long. But essentially, using technology, um, you can sort of oversee your entire portfolio. So if a manager is selling the security, well, it can scan and say, okay, you want to sell 20 shares of this stock. What are the best 20 shares to sell? Usually, you're going to want to sell the shares with the highest cost basis or that you've paid the most for so that the gain is going to be as little as possible. Or again, it might even be at a loss. That's something that can happen uh, when you uh, combine direct indexing and uh, a tax overlay or tax quarterback and then bring active managements underneath that overall uh, umbrella. Yeah. So it's fitting the pieces together is I think the, the real advantage here. Because I, I, as I, as I mentioned, I don't think there's one way to do anything. <laughs> there's lots of ways to, to, to get there. Yes. And uh, I, I, I think I like this approach. You know, um, many clients that we have 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 real concentrated positions in stocks. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they either inherited them years ago. They may have been um, working for a company and received. Uh, stock options or grants, and they have significant unrealized capital gains in those stocks. Uh, and they realize that that they they want to diversify, that they're taking on more risk than than they than they want to because of that that concentration. Uh, but they're hesitant to pay all that capital gains tax in one year. Mm. Could you could you discuss how direct in, in that direct indexing can 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 benefit these investors? Sure. And this is something we um, often refer to as transition management, where uh, if you have a portfolio, say you're, you're bringing it over to an investment manager, you don't have to sell everything and, and take that capital gains hit all at once. You can bring the securities over in kind. In other words, you just take the securities unsold, now move them into this account, and you can use direct indexing to kind of build around the, that security. So uh, a portfolio may, let's say an index has a 3% position, for example, in one individual security. Well, maybe you own a lot of that security. Um, you, could, you could build a, a direct index that has a you know, 5 or 6% uh, allocation, so you don't have to sell as much. Uh, you could also use some of your security to help fund that direct index, the indexing uh, mandate, and then keep the rest of it kind of over to the side where it can't be touched, and it would only get sold when you wanted to. So if you're harvesting uh, losses. Over here, every time you harvest a loss, you could say, okay, now I have an extra loss that I can use. So now I can sell a little bit more of the stock at a gain and they can offset one another. Uh, You could say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with taking this much loss per year and kind of spreading it out over over a series of, of years or um, however long you want to. Uh, and that's a way that you kind of systematically over time gradually unwind the position uh, and not have to do it all at once. But you can still use a direct indexing approach in order to uh, immediately diversify your portfolio more than, than it currently is. Yeah, I, I love this part of this service, this direct indexing is, is that you can fit your capital gain, your, your realized capital gains into the tax year that's most appropriate for you. And it, it's, it's, you're building an investment plan. It's not, right. you're not just accepting the risk, you're doing something about it. And uh, over time, uh, you can wind down uh, that risk, you can increase your diversification. And over time, I think you get better results from an investment portfolio perspective. You know, Matt, I think this is such a timely discussion, you know, especially since we've seen really incredible volatility in the markets over the last few years. But in truth, isn't there always volatility? Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. it's just different causes. Yeah, exactly. So it's not well, this is seems dramatic. And I think the uh, the volume of the noise that we're hearing uh, relative you know, to, the, to the press, it feels like these, these losses are bigger than they've ever been, but they're really not. This is every, every global geopolitical event, every economic event um, experiences gains and losses, 
And this is just another one of them. I, I don't mean to down to 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 downplay it, uh, but it's important that our listeners understand that this is not so unusual when there's when there are, are significant events around the globe. Uh, you know, direct indexing just isn't a panacea. We're still going to have losses, but but realizing the losses and staying fully invested uh, can provide these enhanced after-tax returns. So I. I'm a real advocate. I think it's 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 a real important piece of 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 the investment plan. And Matt, if listeners are interested in direct indexing, what more information should they have? What what do you suggest they do? Well, I think that there's an old saying that you don't necessarily want to have the tax tail wag the investment dog. In other words, you don't want to just focus on one part of your overall plan, such as you know minimizing taxes or what have you. It's kind of part of your overall plan. And there are a lot of moving parts. Obviously, you know, we, had, we had a great discussion uh, about this. I, I, what I think is, is the best thing to do, I mean, I, I, would, I would tell your, your listeners, talk to Peter about this. Talk to, um, go into detail about what your goals are, what your overall portfolio is like, you know, what is the overall plan? Because because really your investments are part of your overall financial picture and they really should support getting you to whatever your financial goals are. Uh, So uh, I would say, you know, sit down, have that conversation um, and, you know, figure out a game plan for uh, for how you want to handle your investments. Yeah, that, that's why I so enjoy working with you and, and frankly, with SEI, uh, because you take that approach, you, you and, your, and your firm, it's the plan first. <laughs> we then can implement the plan and direct indexing might be part of that. Uh, so it's such a, a, it's a part of the overall strategy. So, exactly. Matt, yeah, as I said, it's been it's always wonderful to 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 work with you and to talk to you. I think you're a great resource, and I, um, I you've been very helpful for for my with my clients over the years, and I thank you for that. And if if clients have or listeners have questions, they can certainly go to our our website at raskinplanning.com. Uh, our contact information is there. We've got a couple of white papers. There's I think it's close to 76, 77 uh, podcasts that have been published that people can listen to. So um, I think this just is an important piece of, of all of that. So thank you, Matt. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to do it. All right, gentlemen, this has been a great podcast. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, Peter, thank you for bringing him uh, to the show. Uh, Peter, can you go ahead and give contact information just one more time for those that were trying to write it down and couldn't? Yeah, it's uh, our website is raskinplanning.com and uh, our contact information is right there. So thank you. Yeah, and I'm not even sure, Peter, we've been doing this for quite a while. I'm not sure what number of podcasts this is, but if you're listening to this, maybe for the first time, maybe you've got this shared to you from a friend, um, go to Peter's website. Uh, also, obviously, we, we're going to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, he, he's done so many, and it's just incredibly educational, brings on great guests like Matt today. Um, so again, Matt, thank you so much for being here. And Peter, thank you so much for facilitating this uh, and bringing this information to the audience. And of course, audience, our last thank you goes to you. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Wealth is in the Details podcast with Peter Raskin. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Peter comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This also makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Raskin Planning Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth is in the Details podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. 
Peter Raskin is a registered representative of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Securities offered through Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker, dealer, member SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Sagemark Consulting, a division of Lincoln Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. Insurance offered through Lincoln Affiliates and other fine companies. Raskin Planning Group is not an affiliate of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation and its representatives do not provide legal or tax advice. You may want to consult a legal or tax advisor regarding any legal or tax information as it relates to your personal circumstances.